I will start uh, with a very short introduction on the function of banking and where investment banking fits. Banks provide basically three types of services. They keep our money safe, our deposits, our savings. They maintain the payment system and provide related services, money transfers, cards, etc. And they finance the needs of households, companies, and public bodies. This last function, funding the need of the economy, is done in two radically different ways. The provision of credit on the one hand, uh, this is the way we are all more familiar with, basically. The bank lends money to an individual, to a company, or a local authority, a state, to fund a given project, and will follow on the associated credit risk until the end of the credit, which is until the credit is completely paid back. There is a relationship management dimension to this activity in the long run. The other way is market financing. It was primarily designed to fund the needs of larger companies, larger projects. Indeed, big projects need very big loans, we can be, which can be too big for a sole bank. And uh, market financing, therefore, will consist in making the link between investors, on the one hand, who have excess cash to invest, and companies project in need for large-scale funding. These two ways of funding the economy are radically different, and they've been, therefore, taking place in two different types of banks. You have, on the one hand, the traditional lending activities, on the left side of the screen here, Traditional lending activities are conducted in the commercial bank, also rightfully called credit institution. On the other hand, on the right side, you have the investment banks who do the job of market financing. Historically, as I said, larger projects such as building railways and canals, they demanded larger scale finance than commercial banks could deliver. And banks developed alternative ways to provide credits. So as such, we could say that investment banks complement traditional financing resources and provide scale. And of course, their activities naturally involve financial markets. I will now introduce the different services that are provided by investment banks. Uh, I will drop a few words that might sound a bit technical, but we'll expand on them later on. Market activities include a full range of services. As a general principle, the investment bank acts, as I said, as an intermediary between financial markets and lar large corporations and states. More precisely, the investment bank will provide securities issuers, which are the corporations and the states, with an access to the investing public. This is called securities insurance or underwriting. The bank also acts as a broker for institutional investors. It will act as a market maker. It facilitates mergers and other corporate reorganizations. And on this, I will expand a little bit. Um, M&A, as you know, stands for M merger and acquisition. And uh, this activity is quite well known, uh, I believe, from the public. So I, I will uh, focus on other activities of investment banks moving forward. But I just wanted to, to make a short point on, on M&A. Uh, in this M&A function, in fact, the investment bank is typically advising a company which is for sale, for example. So the shareholders who have decided to sell their share in the company will call the investment bank to support the transaction. The investment bank will help determine the price that the company owners should and could ask from potential buyers. It will provide also a list of potential investors and the bank will approach them. The investment bank will in fact conduct a financial analysis of the company, will prepare the file, the sales speech if you want, and then go to the potential buyers on behalf of its clients. It might also support the deal by providing, for example, bridge loans to the buyer. It might also provide risk hedging solutions, for example, by covering risk related to ex exchange rates. In this typical investment banking activities, as in others, the bank is paid on a fee base, which represent a share of the amount of the deal. So this was just about the M&A quickly. But if I go back to my list, the investment bank also provides other services to investors. For example, it produces research, uh, research which aims at informing investors on market opportunities, what they should invest in, basically. 
A different type of investment banking activity also involves lending to hedge funds. So not only does the investment bank provide services to companies and investors, it also uh, intervenes on the markets on its own. But we will get back to this in a few minutes. And as, uh, as, uh, as far as the activities highlighted in orange in the text are concerned, as well as other key terms, I will explain further in the presentation as we go. So before I explain further the role and functioning of each of these market-related activities, I would like to get back to some simple concepts that will help understanding what follows. Let us take a typical example of a company. It is funded by equity and uh, by debt. It started with the capital brought by a group of investors. Example, individuals starting up a business company creating a subsidiary, etc. This capital has grown over time with the benefits generated by the activity. The growth in capital has allowed for an expansion of the activities and this capital is owned by the shareholders of the company. At some point, and potentially from the beginning, the company has completed its resources, which it uses to, um, to buy material, pay employees, build goods, etc. It has completed its resources with loans, loans that are provided by one or several banks. These loans can be either short term or longer term to support longer term plans of the company. Then, at some point, and as the company grows further, it might consider an increase in its capital that would request not only the initial capital and the accumulated profits made by the company, but that would request fresh capital brought in by new investors. The basic idea is to arrange that the capital to be collected gives right to shares, which are tradable financial assets. The company will call to financial markets by uh, breaking up into small pieces the shares and sell them, sell them directly to investors. Following the same logic, the company might also consider complementing bank lending with market lending. To that end, the company will issue a bond, and a bond is a share of debt. In that case, the loan shall be broken into small pieces, the bonds, that investors, be they private or institutional investors, can buy. Each of these bonds gives the right to a reimbursement of the, uh, and to interest, also known as coupon. A bond can be sold before maturity, provided that the bondholder find another investor who is interested in buying this debt share at an acceptable price. Going to the financial markets as I described, so as a complement to capital uh, provided by initial shareholders and profits accumulated in the past years, plus bank lending. Um, going to the financial markets is typically what larger companies would do. Smaller companies, on the other hand, tend to rely on their own resources and on bank lending. So to wrap up on these basic ideas, both equity and debt of company can become tradable assets. Equity represents the own capital of the bank. It's held by the owners, the shareholders, of the company and each share of the capital gives the right to a share of the value of the company. The debt uh, can be a capital borrowed from a bank or from investors, and this is what the bonds are about, which will have to be paid back by paying back capital and paying interest. I would like just before I move forward to add something that the same goes for public debt. So it's not only the case for companies, but a government can call on for uh, market financing to, uh, get, uh, to get funding. Um, and this is what we call government bonds or gobbies. So a question is, who are the shareholders and bondholders? We know them as the financial markets or the investors. And another question is, where does their capital come from? In fact, if you look at the full chain, as I show it here, 
The bulk of the capital that feeds financial markets comes from us. Most financial assets, the shares, the bonds, and more complex ones, as we will see later, are held by investment funds, professional investors. But behind these funds, there are of course individuals. And as a matter of fact, we are more or less all involved in financial markets. For example, pension funds play a major role. They invest the contributions, the contributions of future pensioners on the markets seeking for returns. Insurance companies are also great actors on the financial markets. They invest the premiums they collect. Usage funds, known as the CCAV in French, also are great investors on the financial markets. And they collect savings from individuals and private investors. There are also other institutional investors, which you can see on the top of this uh, slide, which include private equity funds, hedge funds, as well as large companies with excess cash. This group represents what we call the buy side. And as we will see, banks also buy these financial products. And I have represented this with the, the small lines in, in, in orange. <clears throat> to simplify, we will call them all institutional investors. And in fact, the role played by the investment bank in this scheme, in this uh, flow, uh, is to make the link between companies, corporations in need for capital, I'm saying non-bank capital, and investors looking for investment opportunities. <clears throat> Individuals also hold financial assets, by the way. Uh, they, they can hold financial assets directly, but they are a minority compared to the size of capital managed by institutional investors, by asset managers. Individuals, as I said, are therefore involved indirectly why, uh, via investment vehicles. <clears throat> so the role of uh, the investment bank is crucially to originate securities in the description I make here. This activity is also called uh, securities issuance or underwriting. In this role, this investment bank will identify the need of the company. It will advise the company on the volume, how, if we talk about uh, an increase in capital, how much capital is needed, how much capital we can place, we can sell on the market. It will advise the company on the price, at what price can we expect the market to buy. It, re it will advise on the timing, when is the best uh, window of opportunity to, to uh, issue those shares? It might also uh, advise on the form, what type of securities will, we, will the, the share the company uh, issue. Then, uh, a bit like in the M&A process, the company will find the investors. It will assess what is the investor's appetite for these securities, who they are, how much uh, will they buy, and in that sense, it's important for uh, the investment bank to be quite big, to be quite well connected, uh, to have connections with uh, a large amount of potential investors in order to be able to provide um, sufficient ground uh, to find investors for, for the, the company. Um, in that role, the bank will also commit to hold unsold securities. It will underwrite the securities. In this way, and compared to traditional lending, the, bu the, the bank does not take uh, concentrated credit risks on its own balance sheet and will protect its ability to provide bank credit money. As I said before also, large companies are not the only issuers. Municipalities and states are issuers too. And um, yeah, I mentioned already the guardies. There are two imp other important remarks that I would like to make. Um, first, shares and bonds are tradable financial assets, whereas bank loans by nature are kept by the bank, referring to its commercial banking function. But over the past years, in particular since the early 2000s, bank loans have become tradable assets too, through securitization. Another remark is that there is also a shift in the drivers for capital markets. The needs of companies for capital is not anymore the, driving, the main driving force. 
with the institutional institutionalization of savings, sorry. The driving force is now the need of institutional investors to find assets to invest in. And this has contributed to change the role of investment banks. But investment banks do not limit themselves to securities issuance. The activities comes with a full value chain of services that has developed over time. I will just make a list here. Investment banks create securities, tradable financial assets of a lot of kind. They act as brokers. They also provide companies and institutional investors with hedging services. They create derivatives doing so. Uh, initially to cover risks such as interest rates evolution, changing in uh, foreign exchange rates, but more and more uh, over time with much more complex kind of uh, derivatives. They promote and create investment opportunities, not only simple equities and bonds, but also structured products. And basically, through all these functions, they make the market. Looking at uh, this chain of activities that are conducted in the trading room, they start with the origination of a new financial asset. The investment bank creates the security and hence creates the market for this security. This is what is also called the, the primary market. When arranging the security issuance, the bank will probably commit to hold, as I said, unhold sec unsold securities on its own account. It will therefore, by doing so, hold a stock of securities on its book. At some point, primary investors might be interested uh, in selling these securities. Here come the secondary market. Investment banks also hold these markets in their function of market makers. They will buy the security to potential sellers. They will sell securities to potential buyers. This is what providing liquidity to the market is about. It also justifies the very existence and to a certain extent, the usefulness of market making for the real economy. The thing is that to provide liquidity, market makers must take positions on their own account. Doing so always involves, as all own account trading does, a proprietary element. In addition, all trading activities, including proprietary trading, market making and underwriting, as well as being economically similar, are reliant on the same infrastructure, same settlement, clearing infrastructure. <clears throat> and in fact, this comes because both activities, the underwriting and the market making, involve keeping a stock of assets, as I said. So it will follow that the bank will try and gain from changes in the prices of these assets by buying and selling them repeatedly, making short bets on price evolution. And this is where proprietary comes in proprietary trading sorry, comes in. All these functions are performed in the trading floor of those investment banks where traders are located by the same teams. This is the reason why at Finance Watch we believe that one activity cannot be separated from the other. Trading is a trading. But the types of financial products that investment banks create and put on the markets go much beyond plain securities, be they share or bonds. Investment banks, and uh, more specifically their trading floors, have become over uh, recent years sophisticated engines for the production of complex products, structures, derivatives products. The objectives here is not to say that all these activities are meaningless for the economy. Trading shares and bonds under certain condition, which is include uh, an investing approach, not a view to bet on short-term price variations, can be useful and are useful. Also, simple derivatives can be useful in our economy. The typical example is that of a company based in the Eurozone, who produces in Euros, for example, but buys raw material from a non-EU country. In order to, be, to avoid being exposed to price variations, that would be linked to a variation of exchange rates, the company might go to the bank to cover its risk and buy a derivative. It will ask the bank to guarantee a fixed exchange rate. The bank will take the floating rate risk against a margin. This is what we call a simple derivative. However, most of the financial products that are created today by investment banks go much beyond the needs of the real economy. 
and this has largely contributed to the re recent inflation in the size of financial markets. <clears throat> this is just an illustration of uh, what I said before. Banks make the market. I will try to be a bit quicker now because I see that uh, we've reached uh, 20 Great. minutes already. Um, in fact, when we say bank make the market, it's because they create these products that are sold on the market. And financial markets do not make themselves. They need to be organized. They need building. Banks also provide the infrastructure, like payment services. They provide the liquidity, as I said. They show a price. And um, another point is that financial market inflation has also partly occurred because of the institutionalization of savings, what I tried to represent on the right side. As mentioned earlier, institutional investors such as pension funds, insurance funds, hedge funds, and so on, have invested in these markets on behalf of large pools of individuals. At the same time, the growth of securitization has accompanied ever, ever more borrowing by individuals. And instead of holding these loans on their balance sheets, banks, commercial banks, have packaged these credits into securities, which they have sold into the financial markets. And in this way, uh, and this is a full explanation which you can find on previous reports from Finance Watch, the savings and the borrowing of individuals have fed financial markets where bank and other financial institutions trade financial assets repeatedly seeking profits from price changes. If we now uh, see the result of this, it can be seen in the, the volume that are trading on the financial markets. And I would just like to comment on the evolution in the volumes. The derivatives over 12 years, so from 1990, uh, over 14 years, sorry, um, uh, from 1998 to 12, 2012, um, have uh, multiplied by 12. Over the same period of time, approximately, EU GDP grew by 30%. On the security side, the multiple is 8 over the same period of time, which is also much higher than GDP growth. In these two markets, as in others, growth before the crisis has come from financial firms. And this is reflected in the size of banks. This graph simply shows a typical balance sheet of a large bank, a large universal bank, which is in fact the form taken by typical investment banks in the EU that mingle commercial banking activities with investment banking activities and how it has evolved over time. It follows the curve of the financial market side, volumes. So I will go very quickly through the different, uh, through other uh, features of investment banking that make it so different from commercial banking. This shows the um, uh, funding structure of investment banks on the one hand, which is based on market financing, and commercial banks on the other hand, which is based on deposits. Uh, market financing on the left is short term, potentially volatile, very volatile. Deposit, on the other hand, is more stable on average. Market financing is very interconnected with the rest of the financial sector, whereas deposit financing is less, when it comes at, as a majority of the funding of the bank, is less interconnected. Another major difference is, as you might have noticed, the kind of clients the investment bank is dealing with. There is a limited need of securities issuance for SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. And investment banking is by nature mainly aimed at large companies, at financing large projects. They deal mostly with large international corporates and states. But it is, more importantly, today mostly aimed at the financial sector itself. <clears throat> what also makes uh, investment banking difference is the kind of revenues. On the one hand, you have investment banking, which is based on mostly on fees and commissions. 
And on the other hand, you have commercial banking, which is based mostly on interest rates revenues. The behavior, if I may say, of these revenues, their evolution over time is also different. There is a very recent report from the Bank for International Settlements, the central bank of central banks, that confirms this. They say, we find that institutions engaging mainly in commercial banking activities have more stable profits than those more heavily involved in capital market activities, mainly trading. And these different features also involve different nature of risks. So what are the issues from a public interest perspective? Um, the first issue is that, uh, as I introduced it uh, just before, leading European investment banks are also commercial banks, which means that they also are involved in vital activities, deposits, payment system, which means also that they deserve public protection in case of a crisis. The second issue is that these large universal banks are too big to fail. So these two features mean that we cannot let them fail because of their size and because of the nature of their activities. But a pu public intervention in the same time uh, to save them comes at a huge cost given their size. And here is a short build-up of how it, how it happens. Um, the investment bank, as I said, benefits from the public support that should be limited to the vital function of banking. And it has a, deterrent, uh, a number of deterrent cons consequences and, and creates major distortions. So first of all, the markets acknowledge the implicit support and are more eager to fund an investment bank which is benefiting from a public support. And they do it at a better price. And as the bigger bank, the less chance that the state let it fails, the better the price and the easier access to market funding. This in fact creates a disadvantage for small investment banking boutiques. This allows the large investment bank, backed by commercial banking activities, to fund its, and which funds its activities on the market, to have easier and cheaper access to funding in short. We are in fact in a situation where the bigger is the better hence a race to an ever-increasing size. And this is what happens indeed. Supported by easier and cheaper funding, banks have expanded their market activities more than they would normally do under normal market conditions. Market con uh, activities become much too big and for sure much bigger than what the real economy needs. And if I go back to the trading activities where stocks are being created by the banks for, to support its underwriting, market making, prop trading activities, the funding of this stock is provided at a lower cost than what should have been done under normal market conditions. The bank is also distracted from its basic functions and dedicate more and more attention and resources to market activities, which in the same time are less and less in relation to the real economy. Easy and cheap access to funding, combined with the certainty of a public support, also leads to a decreased attention to the real risk of market activities in which the investment bank is involved. What would you do if a bank would lend you money at a low cost, in huge amounts, and if you were backed by a member of your family with unlimited resources? Would you still pay as much attention to the risks you take? Not sure you would. Mm. If the investment bank had to pay the real cost for the risks it takes, it would certainly not engage in the same activities at, the, at that extent, at the most risky parts would probably come at a prohib prohibitive cost. Sorry. So, in the end, the result is a distortion in the former activities of these banks and, more importantly from a public interest perspective, an increased cost for society in case of a problem, just because the amounts at stake are huge and because we are talking of the security of savings and payment system. Mm -hmm. And in, may I ask you, how long do you still need for the presentation? Two minutes. Great. So this is just to show you visually this build-up. You have the commercial bank on the left side, and then lower cost of funding, leading to our development of market activities, and in the end, the investment bank becoming the most important part of uh, the combined activities, which are called the <coughs> universal banks. 
uh, we call this uh, uh, support, uh, we, we estimate that this support uh, leads to an implicit subsidy, in fact, that trading activities, investment banks benefit from, and the European Commission has uh, evaluated it. You see the figures here. <clears throat> the other problem is that these uh, financial activities, these investment banks in their trading activities, um, do not really face the real economy. If you look at just two categories, uh, the derivatives, for example, uh, a huge financial market made by large universal banks, large investment banks, uh, only 7% of these derivatives involve non-financial company and therefore answer the need uh, of coverage coming from the real economy. If you look at uh, the foreign exchange market and you compare it to international trade volumes, it's quite a striking image too. International trade, which directly needs foreign exchange markets, only represent 4% of the foreign exchange market. And we observe similar proportion as the one observed on forex and derivatives on other financial markets, for example, bond markets, with only 10% facing non-financial companies. So I will conclude now saying that in theory, indeed, investment banking complements traditional banking, which is about credit provision, and it bridges the gap between available savings and funding needs of companies. In practice, investment banking today mostly involves trading activities, which are to a large extent not facing the real economy, partly due to wrong incentives and undue subsidies. Investment banking activities are also mingled with commercial banking activities in the so-called universal banking model uh, that is dominating in, the U in, the, in Europe, and this poses a major risk on public finances and citizens. This is why at Finance Watch we advocate, among others, that these activities of these banks are separated. So if you want to, to find out more, you can uh, go on our website. We published uh, several reports on this issue of separation, in which you will find uh, some information uh, on uh, investment banking activities. And uh, we also just released a new report, um, position paper on the European Commission's on long-term financing initiatives, which is focusing on securitization and securities financing, which to a certain extent uh, uh, can complement but go much beyond what I just explained now. Great, thank, thank you very you. much. I and mean, sorry for being a bit longer than planned. Well, that's very good for digestion, no? Lunchtime, digestion. I'm sure people love listening to you. Uh, Questions are coming in, so thanks for that. Now, if something was not clear, feel free to ask it uh, on the dashboard on the right of your screen. Uh, this is now we got some time for that. Um, but let's take the first question that I come in. Udo is asking, uh, why do we really need market making? Uh, there, there are actually three questions, so maybe, I don't know here if I let you, why do we really need market making? Do banks also make markets for equity markets, for shares of large listed companies? Are bonds not traded on stock markets? I don't know if you can answer them all, because there are questions coming in, but what would you say on the the basis of Udo's question. About the, um, uh, the question uh, whether we really need market making, uh, in fact market making is, as I, as I explained here, to provide liquidity on the market, which means that there are uh, some financial assets that are trading on the stock markets, but a big part of them are not trading on so stock market. So market makers will provide this service of being able to buy or sell at any m point in time because they have some stock, uh, buy and sell uh, specific financial assets, derivative products to uh, those investors or buyers and sellers in need. Mm. Mm, you know what? Fre Frederick just joined us. Frederick works here at the Finance, at finance Watch too. Uh, thanks for coming, Frederick. If you want to, to join this q a you are more than welcome. And do you want to, to add something to what has just been said? Yeah, I mean, market making is, uh, is a very useful activity. It's, uh, it, it provides liquidity. It's basically uh, the job that ensures that you always can find a, a buyer when you want to sell and a seller when you want to, to buy. So in itself, it, it has a social function. It is useful. 
Now, uh, prop trading is problematic to the extent that it may uh, cannibalize other activities and take too much of the, the balance sheet of, uh, of a financial institution uh, uh, to the detriment of other more socially useful activities. Mm -hmm. uh, to answer some other questions, uh, Here, what do we have? We do, have uh, does Goldman Sachs take the same risk as BNP? Well, I mean, there are some similarities to this in the sense that both have investment banking activities. Obviously, the difference is that BNP is a universal bank, uh, whereas Goldman Sachs is a pure investment bank. And also Goldman Sachs is more involved of, uh, into, in prop trading, so it's, it's more of a private equity fund really these days than a, than a bank, I would say. But <laughs> there are a lot of similarities. I mean... Uh, but really, just to emphasize on, on the the very the, the important difference between uh, the case of Lehman and the case of BNP Paribas is that if BNP Paribas has a problem that comes from its market-related activity, uh, it will benefit from public support because it is also uh, involved in commercial banking activities that are vital, that cannot be stopped for more than two or three days. Uh, because it, uh, it it holds the savings, uh, it provides payment services. So, it it is really a fundamental uh, a fundamental issue behind the the combination of uh, commercial banking activities and investment banking activities. Mm -hmm. We get a, a question by by Andre. So banks like Northern Rock and Spanish shaving banks had trouble during the crisis, and why they are uh, and, and why they aren't investment banks. So does this contradict the traditional banking model as safer? Yeah, that's a question I've, I've heard several times. I mean, there is this idea that uh, um, indeed uh, banks like Northern Rock and some Spanish uh, Cajas experienced trouble during the crisis. I mean, that's a fact. Uh, but these banks are not pure traditional investment banks. In fact, uh, these banks uh, were involved in uh, securities financing transactions and some of them were inv also involved in securitization. Mm. When we speak about traditional investment banks, we speak about pure traditional like uh, local local banks for custom lending. Uh, typically, the, the, the stereotype example of uh, tra pure uh, traditional investment, uh, traditional bank would be Svenska Handelsbanken. Mm -hmm. So it does not contradict the fact that uh, traditional banks are safer to some extent. And again, when we speak about safer, it is important to emphasize here that w what we're talking about is from a systemic point of view. I mean, the issue is not so much when one bank fails, because when one bank fails, you know, other banks can buy it and everything. The, the problem is really when all banks experience problems at the same time. And that's what we want to avoid. All right. Uh, question are coming in. Yeah, we have here, Oliver, uh, can traditional banks be profitable enough to be competitive? I think uh, the answer is yes. No? Yeah, I mean, the answer is, is yes. Uh, there was a, a paper uh, from the Bank of International Settlements that was released earlier this month that showed that uh, traditional banks have, in fact, a more stable profitability than investment banks. And also, again, to mention the example of Svenska Handelsbanken, this bank, which is a pure traditional bank, uh, is one of the most profitable in terms of return on equity for its shareholders. Mm. So they can definitely be competitive, uh, competitive enough uh, to ensure that we have a robust European financial industry. All right. Uh, several questions are coming in here. Uh, the questions are of very different kinds, so we have a. Um, which one did you want to answer? Because <laughs> we're three uh -huh. selecting which yeah. one. No, but just no, no, to, to make them, so as a group, them as a group so that we show that yeah, we Yeah, there answer. are several questions about the implicit subsidy. Uh, Robert is asking if the implicit state guarantee shouldn't be seen as an illegal subsidy thus penalized by the Commission. Um, <laughs> we do not go that far for the moment in our analysis. For the moment, what we uh, see that this illegal subsidy, uh, this, uh, <laughs> sorry, this implicit subsidy that the trading activities benefit from clearly distorts uh, the, 
the activities of uh, universal banks. It uh, get them away from their core activities, which is about funding the real economy. Uh, it creates market distortions. It uh, encourages uh, more risk taking. So it is clearly a completely wrong incentive uh, for the for the financial market activities of banks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's somebody talking about you know the Glass Steagall Act of uh, 19. Uh, 33 and then it was repealed in 1999 uh, let me here check because the <coughs> question is really long and I don't see it all like this maybe easy. yeah the question is whether uh, I mean the the repeal of the glass Eagle Act was uh, not due to competitiveness concerns uh, uh, for US banks and what is our view on the current uh, Dodd-Frank uh, Act. Uh, my understanding is that the Graham-Leach Act uh, that repealed Glass-Steagall in 1999 was done to somehow legitimize after the fact the fact that Citibank merged with Travelers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure it was uh, so much a concern of competitiveness. I mean, and in fact, uh, we have seen that despite uh, the Glass-Steagall Act, uh, the US had a very uh, profitable and thriving investment banking industry. So that's the best evidence that uh, separating banks will not necessarily lead to weak mm. uh, European yeah, sure. investment banks. Now, our view on the current US regime, the Dodd-Frank Act, well, for once, we are really not convinced that the Volcker rule is a, a promising avenue. I mm. mean, we are not convinced that you can clearly and cleanly separate prep trading from uh, market making. So I personally find the British approach uh, much more promising and much more in, uh, doable in real life. Mm. And maybe to, to add on that, uh, just referring to what I said earlier in the presentation, uh, the, these trading activities, underwriting, market making and proprietary trading, they go together. So all these proposals that talk about uh, separating proprietary trading cannot do the job because in fact you will end up uh, separating a very limited part of the activity and you will stay with some form of proprietary trading within the remaining activities that are the bulk of the activities. Uh, which are uh, linked to underwriting and market making activities of the investment bank. And market making, by definition, implies keeping uh, for s some period stock. of time mm. a stock of assets mm. until you know you can uh, offload them in the market again. So by definition, it in involves uh, yeah having open positions. And if you either you ban that completely and then you kill market making, which would be really detrimental because market making performs a socially useful function, or you put a threshold, but where do you put the threshold? I mean, it's it's really, yeah, uh, a no-go area for us. I mean, it's really not the way to do it. All right. There is a question by, by, by Michel. Um, not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I, I think I, I see the point. It's like uh, Michel is asking how could it be possible to counter say the big banks when they say that without investment banking activities it would be impossible to make commercial banking. Mm, mm. Um, you I can I can give a first part of answer and you can compliment uh, <laughs> uh, Fred. But the, the work, my, yeah. my my first reaction to this question is that clearly. Um, First of all, investment banking is not targeting household, small uh, and medium-sized companies. And as far as the larger companies and uh, municipalities and states that investment banking uh, is uh, serving, um, it can be done on top of the commercial banking services that is done to this type of clients. This type of clients can go to do two different uh, banks and they already do go to different banks. So there is uh, no point saying that investment bank cannot go without the commercial bank. The only thing that we see indeed is that um, there, there is uh, clearly a support, the uh, consequences of the implicit subsidy I mentioned before, that will be removed and hence some part of the trading activities will become too costly. Uh, 
uh, to be conducted. And uh, this is probably what would happen if we separate the banking activities correctly. There will be uh, some amount of decrease in the financial market um, volumes uh, as uh, the, the investment banks will not anymore engage in those activities that are too risky and not uh, as essential to the real economy. Yeah, I mean, very simply, commercial banking uh, can stand on its two feet and be profitable enough. I mean, it can work, obviously. I mean, uh, I think it's the BIS again uh, who said that, um, you know, we have well capitalized uh, commercial banks are the most able to provide lending on a sustainable basis. Mm. And uh, yeah, as Aline just said, I mean, any ring fencing of investment banking activities would merely prevent uh, some cross subsidization of activities that's all it would do it would not remove economies of scale it would uh, it would not prevent lending at all so yeah i don't see uh, I, I don't see a great concern here all right question by jan <clears throat> so jan is asking uh, if in a scenario of separation how investment banks will be funded um, and in, as I showed, I showed a, a short graph, and, and Fred will complement after. Uh, I showed a short graph uh, earlier um, showing the, the funding structure of investment banks. Investment banks will go to the market to fund their activities. They will issue bonds uh, to, to fund uh, the development of their activities. Yeah, I mean, it will, not, uh, it will not change much because investment banking activities are not funded by deposits. They are funded by uh, securities financing, which is short-term collateralized funding. So it will remain uh, the case that uh, you know, before or after separation, investment banking activities would be mostly funded through wholesale funding, through the market. So it should not impact it. The only impact could be uh, on the cost of this funding due to the removal of the implicit subsidy, that's all. Mm -hmm. But in terms of access to the market, in terms of you know, source investors, it will not, uh, not change much. All right. We're reaching the end of the webinar. Uh, there are still some questions on the line, but we could not answer them all. Uh, sorry about that. This webinar will be online uh, as an interactive video in coming days, so if you want to listen it again while you're lunching, feel free to do it. Now, I mean, seriously, if you want to, to, to spread it, send it to other people. That was the last webinar of 2014. Thanks a lot for being there. Have a wonderful Christmas break. And we, we get back to, uh, next year for more webinars with the team of Finance Watch. Have a great day and uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.